good day viewers and welcome to this week's video. So last Monday we had another antique and collectible sale, a good strong sale with 620 lots. Now I picked four lots to talk about, two of them we'll do in this week's video and two in next week's video. Um, now the two we're going to talk about in this week's video just had to talk about because there was such a strong level of interest, so many inquiries, so many pre-bids and they made such a high price. The problem is they're not lots I'm at all interested in. In fact, I go as far to say they're lots that I dislike quite strongly. But um, I think there's good subject matter there to talk about. That's, that's quite an interesting concept. I was worried about how to approach this and it put me in mind of a cautionary tale that I heard when I first started working there for my dad. And it's, it's the cautionary tale of Ratner's Jewelers. Now some of you will know all about this, you you may even know about the jewellery shops, you may have been to them, um, they're, they're before my time because they're around the 1980s. Now Gerald Ratner is a very successful businessman and in the 1980s he had a whole chain of very successful jewellery shops. I mean it's a bit before my time so I can't really remember them at all. Often in the sale room we see jewellery boxes that have the name Ratner's on and whenever I see those it reminds me of this, this cautionary tale that we're about to explore. I mean a lot of you have probably heard it before but I think, I think it's worth retelling so you can all sort of think about it and, and see how it applies to you. It certainly applies to me now in, in trying to talk about these objects that we're going to discuss next. But Ratner's jewellery stores, um, they offered jewellery at low, low prices and in the, window, the windows they had luminous signs sort of to drag people in, into the store and Gerald Ratner's philosophy of business was you know shout the loudest and offer the best, best uh, bargains or at least appear to offer uh, the best value and that was his philosophy of business to get people uh, into the stores and he did really really well with that and the Ratner group actually included H. Samuel, uh, Leslie Adams, Ernest Jones, Watchers of Switzerland and they have over a thousand stores in the US so hugely hugely uh, successful. But then in 1991 in a conference addressing the Institute of Directors Gerald said this We even sell a pair of earrings for under a pound, gold earrings as well. And some people say, well, that's cheaper than a prawn sandwich from Marks and Spencers. But I have to say, the sandwich will probably last longer than the earrings, but anyway. <laughs> yeah. He went on to say this. We also do this uh, nice sherry decanter. It's cut glass, and it comes complete with six glasses on a silver-plated tray that your butler could uh, bring you in and serve you drinks on. And it's really only cost £4.95. pence. People say to me, how can you sell this for such a low price? I say because it's total crap. So after this very, very candid speech, £500 million pounds was wiped off the value of the Ratner Group and the firm collapsed. I mean, obviously people back then they knew this wasn't fine jewellery, they knew it wasn't huge quality. But to stand up, for the chief executive to stand up and, and you know, really sort of attack his own product like this, um, I suppose in hindsight you could say, well, yeah, what, what do you think would happen? But um, perhaps, he, perhaps he thought people saw it in the same way that he did, but it just goes to show there really is no accounting for taste. Um, but it's not just that really, is it? It's a pair of earrings doesn't have to cost several thousand pounds. That's, that's not important. The value's not important. It's what you think of it. Do you like it? So this all segues us quite nicely into the lots we're going to talk about today. But working in an auction room, you never really know what people are going to bring in. You certainly can't choose what people are going to bring in. And, and often if something's saleable, you really ought to be accepting it and taking it in. I mean, that's not an absolute rule. Uh, there are certainly things that would sell at auction that we don't take. It's a bit of an unusual um, boundary that you need to create. Everybody needs to know the type of sales we want to create, what we want to sell. Antiques and collectibles. It needs to be old or in an old style, uh, sort of household contents, but you've got to draw the line somewhere. That being said, you do sell a lot of things that you don't like. Um, but that's just being an auction room. If you're an antique dealer, you can pick exactly what you want to sell. I want to sell this particular porcelain factory or that type of furniture. I want to focus on the Art Deco period, whatever you want. But if you're an antiques uh, and collectibles auction room that sell things from five pounds up to several thousand pounds, you just got to take what comes in through the door and a lot of it you're just not going to like. That's, that's the fact of it. That's what it's like 
inside a family auction house. So lot 91 and lot 173 of the last sale certainly come under that category for me, things that I really, really did not like. Both from the same vendor and both from what are loosely termed as the Capodimonte factory. So it's an Italian porcelain factory. And the roots of this go way back into the 18th century. Now, the factory in Naples in the 18th century that created figures, these were in soft paste porcelain, around the same time as the very famous Meissen uh, factory and a lot of the good English factories. Um, and these are exquisite works of art worth tens of thousands of pounds. Uh, but the firm closed in the 18th century and then you get other firms springing up in the 19th and 20th centuries right up to modern day sort of riding on the success of the coattails of that early 18th century factory. So although they're loosely termed Capodimonte, it's not really that original early 18th century factory. But as we're about to discuss and as we're about to see, they're still very, very popular. Now all these figures in these two lots were made around the 1980s. Uh, and they're all done in very much the same style, this, this very Victorianized um, view of the 18th century. So all figures in 18th century dress, um, very elabor elaborately moulded with applied flowers. They have this sort of neo rococo gilding, which is, I really don't want to do a ratner, but not a nice gilding at all, really sort of brassy looking. Um, I mean, there's a hell of a lot of workmanship in there. I mean, they're, they're not made on the cheap, they're not just pressed into a mould and, and, and done out in mass. Each one of these figures, all the separate elements would have been made in separate moulds, um, and then a modeler has to then affix each one to uh, build up the figure piece by piece. So all this applied work, all these flowers, each leaf individually put on there. And it would take a craftsman to put them together because, I mean, if I were to do it, just stick the arms and fingers and hands on, uh, they'd look like some kind of Frankenstein monster. So you would have to have some artistic flair to, to make these figures pose just the way you wanted them. They've then got it all be hand painted. So yes, there is an awful amount of work goes in there. And they are signed uh, by the artists as well. A lot of our figures in these two lots were signed by the artists that put them together and, and sculpted them. So when coming to catalogue and estimate these pieces, you obviously got at the back of your mind that they're not very old. They're from the 1980s, from the same period when all that Ratner jewellery was flying around. Not that they're related at all, but... Um, so you think of they're not very old. As we know, age is not always important when it comes to value, but it often is. Um, and you think it as well, you know, you see an awful lot of Capodimonte on the market. Not always signed pieces, but we do see an awful lot of it. So, the first lot, lot 91, we have five figures. The estimate is a very low, and saying this in hindsight, a very low 20 to 40 pounds. Um, it was obviously a bit of a come and buy me estimate, and if you'd have asked me before the sale, I'd have said we might get £100. So let's see how we got on. Lot 91, five porcelain figures, mostly Capodimonte, including a lady playing the piano, courting couple, etc. Some signatures and a lot, a lot of interest. We're starting at 424, 40, 460, 480 with you. All internet bidding at 480. Telephone bidder is waiting, 500, 550, 600, 650 with you. Internet bid is at 650, 700, 750, let's see, 800 with you. Bids at 800, the Capital Monte. All this is online, telephone bid is waiting. We're at 800, 850, let's see. 850, 900, 950 with you. Will we break 1,000? We're at 950, 1,000, 1,001 we're looking for. So yeah, got to 1,000 pounds already. So that's 10 times the amount that I thought they would have done if you'd have asked me pre-sale. Clearly broken a thousand. One thousand one, looking for one thousand two, one thousand three with you. <coughs> Bids at one thousand three, one thousand four, the phone bid is still waiting. One thousand four with you. Bids at one thousand three seems to have settled online. We'll try with the telephone. One thousand four, we're asking Jane. That's fine. With the uh, internet, then at one thousand three. If you're all through, then the internet bid. All the actions online at one thousand three hundred pounds. Sold. I'm quite amazed at £1,300. I, I mean, I judge that as a, a strong, strong price. I was asking £1,004 from the phone bidder who never actually got a bid in and, you know, he, he backed out. So all that was online on the internet. Uh, doing a little bit of looking after, I've seen the girl playing the piano a number of times at other auctions, various prices, 800 up to £1,000. So it, it seems like um, that was the market value for, for this, this sort of group of figures. 
uh, yeah, quite impressed, quite surprised. Uh, I've certainly not changed my opinion. I, I don't like them. I, you know, they're, they're good quality, good workmanship, but I, I don't think they're in the best uh, possible taste. Um, but yeah, that's, I think that's what, what makes this another, another reason what makes this business so great. Uh, if you were to give me £1,300 to go out there and spend on antiques, I'd spend it on something totally different, which a lot of people would find that awful and tacky and, and probably not nice at all. And, and that's good. It's good that we all like different things. Otherwise, we'd all be after the same stuff and nobody would be able to buy anything. Uh, so anyway, let's look at the other lot. Lot 173 then, seven porcelain figures of ladies, some Cabaret Monte, including reclining figure. Uh, three figures signed, uh, those there. So I kind of anticipated it this time, I've already got one lot sold through. I knew that this lot had, had quite a bit of pre-sale interest. And as I'm reading out the description, as you could see there, I've already got the pre-bids lighting up on the, um, on the auctioneer screen. So I know we're in for a similar sort of ride. And here we go again, internet bid 750, 800. 850 we're looking for. Internet bidders fighting out the Capri Monte. 900, 950, let's see, 1000. Broke four figures, they were at 1,000. 1,001, 1,002 we're looking for. Again, we have a telephone bit of waiting. 1,001 we've got on the internet. Looking for 1,002 now. Seems to have settled at 1,001. All this on the internet so far. 1,002? No problem. Bids at 1,001 then on the internet. All the action online with saleroom.com at 1,100 pounds. And please put those safely, Uncle Steve. Thank you. So the four figures again for the Capri Bonte and all online again and the phone bidder didn't get a look in again, uh, which is fine. I mean, sometimes you get phone bidders, must have a phone bid, got to have a phone bid, but, and then they, they don't bid with an estimate. And sometimes that's quite annoying. But this guy, I mean, we, we were way over estimate and, and he didn't get a bid in. And that's fine. They were obviously more than what he was wanting to pay, uh, which is understandable for, for me at least. Um, but yeah, 1,001 and 1,003, so 2,400 pounds for a group of these modern Italian porcelain figures. But it really does take all sorts and it makes, makes this job interesting. You don't know what you're going to see from sale to sale. I mean, I've been doing this in 2001, which I've said relatively compared to other people, it's, it's not a huge amount of time, but, but still after 18 years, you, you're still getting surprised uh, at work, which is, which is good. I like that, that's fantastic. So thanks for coming over and watching again. Uh, and just remember, remember the moral of the Ratner story. We don't all like the same stuff. We don't all have to have stuff that's worth thousands and thousands of pounds. And when our sun explodes and devours the entire solar system, none of this is gonna matter anyway. So anyway, have a top week and I'll see you next Saturday when we're gonna discuss two more lots, two different lots this time from our last sale. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already. Leave a like and uh, I'll see you in a week. I say because it's total crap.